today's topic is an interesting one. Again, this was the second topic that Brother Leslie chose for us. Because I asked him, what would you like the topic to be? And the first one was on the Tipitaka, the second is this. Basically, similarities and differences between the Sasana, the Dhamma, and what we see within Jainism. There's many interpretations, depends on who you speak with, of course. Wearing the robes, being a bhikkhu, somebody listening to me or someone like myself, they will say, ah, of course you're going to hold the position of the Buddhist position, you know. Well, that might be the case if we have not studied the texts and the historical background as to where we come from. Many of the terms that we use were used, the terms themselves, the superficial terms, they were already in usage when Lord Buddha began to teach. Sometimes we forget that. But we also neglect to consider that the terms that Lord Buddha used were just the terms that had or kept the similarity factor. The interpretation means everything. That is the juiciest part of everything. That's what matters. I had an aunt. I used to go to her house and she had this bowl on her kitchen table when I was a child and I would be hungry and the bowl would have fruits in it. The only problem was they were not real fruits. You know which ones I'm talking about. The fake ones. Plastic. Painted nicely. Looks like a pear. Glistening, beautiful. You reach for it and it's light. Well, this is not how an apple is supposed to be. Something's wrong. So I would like you to have that idea, approach, when we're talking about the similarities between Jainism and Buddhism. Even though I don't like to use the word Buddhism, but for usage, conventionality's sake, let's let us. Now, what are some of these terms? Well, we'll start with the most obvious one. Tathagata. We use the word Tathagata thinking that it's only referring to the Buddha as Buddhist, yes. But it was already in usage at the time of the Buddha. Many people called themselves Tathagata. I always have a difficulty. Which is Mahavira. I like to use it. It's a shorter term. He used to refer to himself as Tathagata. As a Jina. Jina is a conqueror. Conqueror. And there's another term we like to use a lot. Kamma. Right? The giants call it karma. Well, that was not a Buddhist term. See, when you want to teach something, you don't have to reinvent everything to give you a rather conventional or superficial example or mundane example. If you want to start a business, a company, you don't have to start by building the building from scratch where your business is going to be, right? A smart businessman will go ahead and use a building that is already in place. You already saved so much money. You don't have to worry about contracts, engineers, architects, permits. It's already there. Think of it in those terms when we're looking at terms like karma or kamma, as we like to call it in Pali. Now, just to give you a background scene of where 
Lord Buddha landed, where the sasana began, we have to understand that at the time, prior to the introduction of Buddhism and Jainism, you had two primary ways of thought to understand, to point out where knowledge could be found. How could knowledge or understanding be introduced into a person's experience? So how can someone know, basically? There were two branches of such knowledge. One was the Brahmanas method, which was mostly about hearing, anussala it's called, hearing, listening, repeating, you can call it tradition, where later on we're going to talk about the Kalama Sutta. Lord Buddha points that out based on tradition only, right? Many people believe that. Today, even among Buddhists, us Buddhists, we have that. So we can't just label it as Jainism or this and that sometimes. It's, it's the attitude, the behavior behind it, which I will try to shed some light on later. So you had first this hearing, listening tradition of repeating. But then you had also the Upanishadic tradition, which had a lot to do with perception and inference. Inference is um, coming up with a conclusion based on secondary or non-direct pieces of evidence. Let's say you hear the alarm, the fire alarm bell go, beep, 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 something like that. And then, maybe you smell some smoke. And then you see some people running in the corridor, in the hallway, saying, fire, fire. You go ahead and you say, well, there must be fire. But did you see any fire? No. Now, it could be so many different reasons. Those people might be acting. Maybe there's a malfunction with the alarm. We don't know. Maybe the window was left open and a car went by and the carbon monoxide from the back of the car was blown into by the breeze into this room. All of which could have easily fooled us. And that is inference. So that was more of the Upanishadic, if we use as an example. So these were the two main, if we narrow it down, two ways of thinking and coming up with an understanding about life. Then there was the introduction of the experientialists. That's the category where both Dhamma, or before us, Jainism, and later Buddhism came about. These two. Now, I, would try, I will try to point out the similarities and the differences. I will only be touching the tip of the iceberg, by the way. It's just very little because I'm more interested with the human element behind it. What was the relationship like with Mahavira and Lord Buddha? I'm more interested in that than these similarities, but I will try my best to shed some light. So karma or kamma, you had, you still have today, to this day, people who are in the camp that thinks that kamma is set, is set. So you have different classes. If you're born in a Sudra class or low class versus a Kattiya or Kshatriya, warrior class, or a Brahmin class, sorry, that's it. The best thing you could do is work towards gaining a better rebirth next time. But in this life, you're stuck with this. So this is, to this day, valid, thousands of years later. This was also a perspective that people held on to tightly at the time of the Buddha. And then you had the Jainist uh, position towards karma. I say karma because that's how they say it. We call it kamma, but it's the same thing. Now, they don't use the word karma as far as we understand karma, meaning action. 
For them, it is danda. Danda means a rod, a stick, a punishment even. Discipline, karma, which they use danda for, the term danda. It could also mean a club, uh, something that you hit. Um, so, that's also deterministic. A person is born with different levels of karma. They have an almost, some people say not just almost, really, atomic level karma. So it is basically very tangible, touchable. Karma is so real for them. And the whole objective of life is to chisel, remove more and more karma. And that is where the objective of the spiritual life lies for the Jain person. So imagine your Jiva. Jiva is the, uh, think of it as the soul they have. They have two categories of Jiva. One is a liberated jiva, the other one is unliberated. Unliberated means a person whose karma has a lot of bonds on it. Bonds are like, they literally say, it's, uh, it has a color. It's black, and you have to remove it. How? Well, first of all, those bonds that attach themselves to the jiva of the person, which also are the reasons why you are born the way you are in the class of society that you're born into. So again, it is deterministic. Again, it is not so different than the Brahmin's approach of karma. There's some wiggle room, but still it's very deterministic. It's very fatalistic. It's fate-based, not faith, but fate. It's, it's locked. And they actually live their lives by having the person cut away at the thickness, they call it tightness, of the bond, of karma. Well, what types are there? There is loose bond, there is tight, bond, there's tighter bond, and there's the tightest bond. And for each of these, there are penance-like actions. Penance means, well, the first one is regret. If a person does something, there is a type of kamma bond, where by simply having the regret, that loose type of bond of the kamma comes off. Okay? The second kind is where there is a little bit tight bond on the kamma. For us, it sounds very strange, but this is their belief system when it comes to karma. For those types, which is the second category, which is the tight type of bond on the karma, for that, you need to apologize for whatever you did. So it's very much like penance. When a Catholic goes and confesses, for example, and they apologize at church, it's very similar to that. For the third level, which is tighter category of bond on the jiva of the person, which the person has to work to relinquish, remove, so they can become liberated. For that, they need to do strict austerities. Austerities. Uh, what we can call also tapas. Uh, they also use that term, by the way, which has to do with heat, where you're dedicating yourself. For example, when you fast, when you don't eat, when you sit in meditation for long hours, what is that? That's applying heat, tapas. You're exerting energy. And then there's the fourth kind, which involves all of them, but especially asceticism. Asceticism, which means you really become like a recluse and you're really attacking the kamma. Now, uh, so, but I didn't mention uh, our Buddhist position about karma. How did the interpretation of Lord Buddha differ from what these people were saying? 
he introduced this thing called Chaitana. Simple but very important point. He said, it's not deterministic at all. It's not like you're stuck with it. To this day, sometimes I hear people say, oh, it's because of your kamma that you're in this position. Not exactly. That's not a Buddhist position. What happened to your chetana? You had to decide to come here tonight, you know? It's not just your kamma. Kamma is action done in the past. Otherwise, it's very deterministic, fatalistic. So chetana, the mind basically, is the doer of kamma. That is the Buddhist interpretation versus this mysterious power that's at play, which is the Jainist perspective. And they spend their whole lives cleansing themselves, cleansing themselves from the Kamma. This is the biggest part of Jainism because the whole religion revolves around the jiva becoming purified. In order for the person to taste amrita, amrita is immortality. Immortality. In Brahmanism, you have the Brahmin wanting to unite with Mahabrahma. That's their goal, to unite, to become one with Brahma. In Jainism, you don't have that. It's a matter of cleansing so that you become a liberated jiva. They have 24 Tirtankaras, Tirtankaras, the last of whom was Mahavira, who was partly contemporary of Lord Buddha. Partly because he was about 25, 30 years older than Lord Buddha, Mahavira. And uh, I also want to address tonight um, um, a few incidents from the suttas that we get, a report as to how did Mahavira treat Lord Buddha? Because we never hear this today in this very um, open society where we have to just be, yes, let's accept everyone, integrated society, which is good, but we also have to be honest with the data and the real facts. So I would like you to think about those fake apples and the real apples. Years ago, a therapist friend of mine said, trust the behavior, never the words. If you take anything from tonight's talk, I will be happy if that's it. If you take that with you. Never trust only the behavior. Trust, I mean, uh, trust the words. Trust the behavior, not the words. A person can come and say, I love you or I will pay you the money that I owe you. They cry, they beg, you say, okay, fine. Their behavior says something else. But we try to believe and believe and believe. So, looking at Jainist uh, uh, positions or theories or their core beliefs, and then you compare them with what we have today. Before in India, uh, before Buddhism disappeared from India, rather, it didn't happen overnight. It started diluting. It started having other influences coming in, infiltrating into the sasana, into the teachings of Lord Buddhas. And that happens from the inside out and outside in. You have to have individuals who are introducing foreign ideas. Sadly, this was not just happening after Lord Buddha's death. This was happening while he was alive. We neglect to consider this. We have so many monks who show up who are actually teaching people things that have nothing to do with the Dhamma. And then you hear the other bhikkhus saying, no, 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 friend, Avusa, no, you can't say that. This is not what Lord Buddha teaches. What are you teaching? 
You're teaching soul concept. This is not what Lord Buddha taught. And they go and report it to Lord Buddha. One of them is uh, Sati, son of a fisherman. And he actually believed that there is a soul jumps from one life to the next. And Lord Buddha says, call him over. Let's, let's talk to this person. And he says, have you ever heard me say such a thing? So you had all these elements already infiltrated and spreading, especially after Lord Buddha died, to the point where you had the, uh, what later on became Hindu religion, known as the Hindu tradition, even though there's more, you know, there's, there's thousands of different types of Hinduism. We just use one term to describe them. But they took Lord Buddha and included into their pantheon of deities, where Lord Buddha became an avatar of Vishnu, right? Has nothing to do with any historicity, has nothing to do with Lord Buddha. But, and you say you have the same thing with pictures of, uh, or sculptures of uh, giants Mahaviras, position, sitting, meditation, and Lord Buddha. It's, it's, it's like the same image. And anybody who has not studied art or that part of, of that part of the world doesn't know the differences, the slight differences. They wouldn't know the difference. Well, what are we talking about then? Influence. Influence. So when you say to the Buddhists, hey, you're not so different from us. Your Lord, Buddha, is actually, he's, take it easy, he's one of us. Yeah, he's, he's, he's one of us. He's simply an avatar of Vishnu. So we are brothers. So let's come and pray together. Let's have the money come into the same temple. Influence, ultimately. There's a term in biology, we call it emergence, where you have a group of single-celled organisms who come coalesce together and all of a sudden they look like they are one single organism. There's billions of them. And when you look at them, you think it's, it's like there's a higher intelligence that's guiding them. There's this there's unifying force behind it. But nature is always trying to coalesce all these elements together. If there is no wisdom, <laughs> if there is wrong view in this case, and there's a lot of wrong view, unfortunately, a lot of people look at the fake apple, the plastic empty apple, shell of an apple, painted, and say, ah, it's the same as your, what you're teaching here in the Dhamma. They also have the Sangha, in their Sangha, they, they also have the Sadhus, Sadvis, Shravakas and Shravikas. What we call Bhikkhu, Bhikkhuni, Upasaka, Upasika. Ah, oh, so you're like us. We're just a difference in terms. No, there's more to it than just a difference in terms. Well, what are they? Remember the danda I mentioned? They don't use, at least in those days, they didn't use the term kamma. We have a few wonderful suttas, specifically from the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length discourses. One of them is called Upali Sutta, and the other one is called Abhaya Raja Kumara Sutta. Uh, 56 and 58, Majjhima Nikaya. Now, in it we see Nigantanata Putta, Mahavira, surrounded by supporters. And he, remember, he was there before Lord Buddha became the Buddha. He was born before him. And he had established a community behind him. And many of the royalty, wealthy people, were his supporters. Now, in time, when Lord Buddha began his dispensation teaching, many of these supporters left the giant camp and went to join 
Lord Buddha. Because of what they saw that contradicted what they saw in the behavior of the giants, contradicting what was being taught behaviorally. Trust the behavior, never the words, right? In the Upali Sutta, we see uh, one of the devout followers of, Jai, of, of Mahavira. His name was Diga Tapassi. He was a tall ascetic. Diga means long, tall. So he was there at Lord Buddha's uh, presence. And he comes and sits down. And Lord Buddha, as was customary for him, he would like to engage in a conversation. So he asks this Diga Tapasi, whom he knew was a very close, close student of Mahavira, he says, uh, actually, Diga Tapasi asks Lord Buddha, I think, he says, um, what is the position between wholesome and unwholesome? How do you categorize unwholesome behavior? And Lord Buddha says, there's three categories. There's kāyo kamma, to do with the body, kāya. There's vachi, voice, speech, verbal action, kamma. And there's mano, which is mind action, mental action. He says, oh. And out of all these, he asks, which one is the most important? And this is a crucial part, to know the difference. And this is a big difference. This difference is, is enough to separate those two. Lord Buddha says, out of all these, even though each of them are important, the mind, he says, is number one. And he asks, really? Three times, Diga Tapasi asks, do you say it's the mind? Lord Buddha says, yes, it is the mind, Diga Tapasi. In those days when they would debate, Three times was like concretizing your statement. That's it. You can't back away from that. Now you are committed. And people are listening. And then it's Lord Buddha's turn. And he says, how about you? How does your teacher, Mahavira, Nigantanata Putta, categorize actions? And Lord Buddha uses the word kamma. And Diga Tapasi says, no, no, Mahavira, my teacher, does not use Kamma. And what does he use? He says, Danda. Danda, which is a rod, a cane, punishment, discipline. Depending on the context, it takes, you know. But essentially, they're talking about action. It's just a word that is different. Similarly, and here's another similarity. He says, body, Danda. Speech, verbal danda, and mano, mind danda. Ah, and then Lord Buddha asks him, and among these three, which one does your teacher, Nigantanata Putta, consider to be the topmost, important? And he says, oh, it's the bodily. He says, oh, it's the bodily. Hmm. Are you saying it's the bodily? So three times now, Lord Buddha asks him. Three times, Diga Tapasi says, yes. He says, ah. Unfortunately, Diga Tapasi being so staunchly attached to his teacher's teaching, devout follower, he gets up and leaves. He goes to Mahavira and he recounts all that happened. As he's sitting there, one of his lay supporters, Mahavira's very wealthy supporter, whose family has supported Mahavira and all the Jains prior to him, he gets up and says, Bhante, I will go. I will beat this Gautama. I will prove him wrong. In fact, I will make him your student. I will toss him around, he says, left and right, up and down. And he goes on like several paragraphs where he's basically insulting. But he's so full of confidence 
Now Diga Tapasi is smart, he turns and says, no, 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 don't let this man leave your sight because Gautama, Master Gautama, he has converting magic. You say, what? Conver he converts people. How? Remember, so many wealthy, well-to-do Jain leaders of the community, wealthy, wealthy princes and, you know, businessmen, had switched allegiance. They had left Mahavira and had gone being students of Lord Buddha. One of them being Vappa uh, from, uh, I believe he was from Vesali, and then Siha, the general. And now they were afraid they don't want to lose Upali because that's so much prestige. So he says, Mahavira, with all his um, confidence or arrogance, turns to Diga Tapasi and says, no, 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 let him go, I trust him. In fact, he will become his student. And if he's not, he says, I will spew blood, I will vomit blood. That's how confident I am. So this goes back and forth, and finally Upali goes, and Upali, uh, Upali goes, and uh, Lord Buddha always had a tradition of asking, is this your position, etc. Now Upali turns and says, uh, Master Gautama, did Diga Tapasi come here? Did he have a conversation, a debate with you? And he says, yes. And what was the topic? This was the topic, excellent. And then Lord Buddha says, well, would you like to have a short, simple debate here? And Upali, I mean, that was the reason why he was there. He says, yes. He says, are you sure? He says, yes. Whatever the outcome, whatever the outcome. Okay, he says, let's then go ahead. In Jainism, they wear masks long before we had, were wearing masks. They would avoid drinking cold water because they believed even then that there are microorganisms inside the water. Now, the way they had gone around this was to boil the water. Well, what does the boiling of the water do to any living organisms inside of it? Kills it. That is an accepted practice, in fact, an encouraged practice. And Lord Buddha knew all this, and he says, imagine there is a person who is sick, who's dying of fever, but he is refusing to drink the cold water because he needs to practice what Mahavira teaches. And the man says, Upali says, yes, that's, that's good of him. And he says, what if the man dies? He didn't commit anything. But he followed his mental action, didn't he? Yes, he says. What does your Mahavira say as to where the destination of this person would be after death? He says, ah, he will be born in the highest of realms of devas. So he says, you just admit the fact that by his mental action of choosing not to do something, his mental action of holding tightly to the teaching, that got him to be reborn in the heavenly realms. And he says, no, 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 that's, that's, uh, you know, you still, I still believe, he says, that physical action, bodily action is more important than the mental action. And this goes on again and again. And finally, Upali says, Bhante, enough, enough, enough. One example was enough. I just wanted to make sure that I'm sitting with a teacher. I was so impressed by your first example, he says, with the water. And he swears allegiance to Lord Buddha right there. Now, look at the kindness and uniqueness of Lord Buddha's generosity. He says, no, 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 no. Don't become my student yet because you have supported the giants for you and your family for generations. Upali says, now, Bhante, I love you even more. I respect you even more. 
Because if it was Mahavira, he would have used me like a banner, moved me from city to city, showing off this very wealthy new student of his. But you're refusing to. And this goes on and on. And finally, Lord Buddha says, okay, next time they come in, please, he says, give them food. And he says, Bhante, I respect you even more. Because I heard from Mahavira that Gautama, the Buddha, tells that only merits will come if food is offered to me and my students. But here I am seeing you saying, no, give them food too. You will not see this in the giant texts. Never. But you will find it in the suttas. Because the suttas have tremendously beautiful records of what really happened. And Lord Buddha teaches him, teaches him about the devas, he first teaches him about dana, and then he teaches him about uh, the benefits of virtue, sila. Slowly, slowly he teaches him the teachings that are unique to a Buddha, meaning the Four Noble Truths. And at the end of that talk, Upali sees the Dhamma. He experiences Jnana Dasana. He experiences, he becomes a Sotapanna. And he bows down to Lord Buddha and he goes straight to his palace and he tells his guard, next time Mahavira comes, don't open the gate. Don't give them food until I decide. They cannot come inside, he says. And it's a beautiful sutta. And there's another sutta, Abhya Rajam Kumara Sutta, where Mahavira does another, he, he tells one of his students, which happens to be a crown prince, Abhya Raja. Uh, well, Prince Raja is a crown prince, so he's Abhya. Um, and Bhaya means fear, Abhya means fearless. And uh, he tells this prince, go to Gautama, I want you to ask him this question. Does the Tathagata ever use unwelcome words? Words that might sound mean, hurtful to someone who listens, who's, who's addressed in those words. He says, yes, Bhante, I will go. And he also was a big supporter of Mahavira. Now, because it's late, Prince Abhaya is going towards the, the monastery of where Lord Buddha was. And he says, now it's too late. It's, it's inappropriate. So let me go actually have food prepared and send my uh, servants to announce the time that you know, they could come and have dana in my own palace. And that's what happens. So the next day, next morning, Lord Buddha and his disciples, are the, the Arahants, are there at Prince Abhaya's palace. And Prince Abhaya is excited. He's going to ask his question. And he's going to prove himself worthy of his teacher's affection. And he says, Bhante, has it ever happened where you have said unwelcome words, uttered words that might seem hurtful? Or do you approve of saying, uttering unwelcome words? And Lord Buddha says, well, Prince, that all depends. And guess what Prince Abhaya does? He says, ah, the Mahavira people have lost. Lord Buddha says, do explain. What do you mean by that expression? He says, Bhante, I was supposed to ask you this question. He sent me to ask you this question. And the whole point was because Lord Buddha had said about his brother-in-law, Devadatta, that he was going to go to hell for his actions. And Mahavira was using that as an example. How could you be a Buddha and say such harsh words? So you're, and if Lord Buddha said no, they would have used the statements that Lord Buddha had said to or about Devadatta because of his actions. And Lord Buddha smiles and he says, meanwhile, Prince Abhaya has his infant in his lap, playing. And Lord Buddha says, that child in your lap, if you were feeding your child 
and a little bit of rice got caught in his throat, what would you do? He says, Bhante, I would use my finger, I would, I would get whatever food was stuck in his throat out, even if it meant drawing some blood. I want to save my child. He says, ah. That's exactly what the Tathagata does. If the Tathagata uses unwelcome or harsh words, then there must be a reason for it. There must be causes for it. So when I admonish a student, he says, there's a reason for it. Now, it might seem unwelcome, it might sound unwelcome, but given the context, the timing, everything has to be perfect and necessary for the teacher to say that. And there goes another very wealthy sponsor. So they were losing so many sponsors, the giants. But over centuries, uh, actually right after uh, the death of Mahavira, which happened at the end of Upali's inside that sutta, we hear it, when Upali says 10 verses of homage to Lord Buddha, now he being a Sotapanna, he, he gets up and he turns towards the direction of Lord Buddha and he bows down to the teacher and he gives these accolades, these beautiful verses, ten of them. Right on the spot he weaves those verses and Mahavira, who is being now in his mind disrespected because he has a higher seat. Upali got himself on a higher seat and Mahavira was on a low seat. And Mahavira did not accept that. And now his biggest supporter was someone, his own rival's supporter and student. Finally he vomits blood and dies. Right there. Now, it doesn't end there. Because twice at least it has happened where uh, they were losing so many supporters. Twice there were uh, accusations against Lord Buddha himself. One was with a woman who, they, an actress, someone that they paid money to pretend that she was pregnant. Pregnant by Lord Buddha, none other. They accused him. And the woman comes in the middle of the Sangha and she points the finger and she says some derogatory terms to Lord Buddha and Lord Buddha is just sitting there quietly. The Sangha, Arahants are not moving and saying, but they weren't all Arahants, you know. Some were being agitated and many lay disciples were there. And as this woman is trying to get a rise out of Lord Buddha, nothing is happening. She's yelling and screaming. As she's running, the belt that she has tied around her waist with the pillows, she steps on one that's hanging loose and everything comes off and the pillows and all these things that she had around her waist fall. The deception is revealed. The jig is up. And she's caught, but Lord Buddha says, don't do anything to her. You know, and she confesses that it was the Mahavira's people who paid her. Now, it had a nasty turn when they kept on coming back and one time they had one woman who accused, they paid her very well and she said uh, they had people see her as if she was leaving Lord Buddha's Kuti. These were Mahavira's people, Jains. And then they had some people who came and actually killed her. And this was happening nowhere other than the Jetavana monastery in Savati. And these people buried her inside Savati's Jetavana, this woman. And then they pretended these people who had paid for all this, they went and they started looking. And uh, they went to King, at that time I believe it was King Ajata Sattu. They said, well, there are rumors that there's this woman, our friend had died. And they are saying that she died in Jetavana Monastery. So please send your soldiers so they can investigate. Lo and behold, they extract the body and they... Well, it's inside the Buddhist monastery. What do you think? 
everybody's finger was pointing at the Sangha. And many people came and they were, well, obviously people in Savati were not even offering food for the Sangha. They were insulting. And Lord Buddha said, seven days, seven days. And if somebody still comes and taunts you, say these words. And he gives a beautiful verse about being innocent and still having kanti, patience. And how those who accuse you based on false statements, they will end up facing those crimes. And lo and behold, that's what happens and they all get punished. But the thing that really touched me deeply was when before Lord Buddha died, they went after Venerable Mahamugallana, the Jain people. They hired mercenaries to go into the kuti of Venerable Mahamugallana because they thought that the great re the reason why Lord Buddha was still getting so many followers was because of the psychic powers of Venerable Mahamugallana. He was famous. So they didn't want Lord Buddha to be that famous because of Mahamogalana. So they thought if we get rid of Mahamogalana, Lord Buddha would not have that much fame. So because Venerable Mahamogalana was second only to the Buddha in his psychic abilities, he was supreme. Every time they approached his kuti, he would know. He would read their minds and he would disappear. But eventually he was tired. And he said, let me see, why are these people coming? Why, why are they wanting to kill me it's with so much passion? So he looked into his past, into his past lives. And he saw that long time ago, eons and eons earlier, he had killed his own mother and father, who were blind. And he says, ah, that's why. And the next time they came, Venerable Mahamogallana allowed them to kill him. Because he was already old. He was older than Lord Buddha. He was old, older, I think he was 80, plus 80-something. 80, 80 but then they leave and he puts his body back together because he had that much ability and he goes because he has to pay his last respect to Lord Buddha. He goes all bloody, his robes are tattered, bloody, barely has enough ability to keep his body functioning. And Lord Buddha says, Mugallana, why don't you go ahead and give your brothers the Sangha last Dhamma Desana. This is the last time they will get this chance. And he says, yes, Lord. And he gives them a lovely Desana and then he dies. So any time I hear, one time I was at a retreat, um, a Vipassana retreat years ago, and uh, there was an older gentleman who was a giant. Every few sentences that he would hear the Dhamma, he would say, oh, it's the same thing as Mahavira, my teacher, my, our, every five seconds it was something like that. So I had to pull him aside and the bhikkhu in charge, he said, could you talk to him? So I ended up spending those 10 days, every day, giving him a Dhamma talk on the differences between Lord Buddha and Mahavira. And he still kept on having the strong belief that, no, 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 it's the same thing with us. But when you look at the facts, completely different. The historical facts, completely different. So on the outside, it might look like a real fruit in, in the US or in English, we have a term like if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, looks like a duck, it is a duck. So, um, not to in any way, shape, or form try to trivialize it, but there is a lot of um, taking on the colors of the Dhamma to gain 
some type of acceptance without, and you have many, many people who do believe in the similarities rather than the differences, and there are far more differences than any similarities. On the superficial level, yes. Like mentioned earlier about terms like karma, we don't have that fatalistic, deterministic position towards karma. There's no way that anyone can get rid of, cut out your karmas, your actions, your vipakas. What, that's what we mean by karma or kamma in our tradition. It's the vipaka, the fruits of the kamma. There's no way because we have had so many incalculable eons of lifetimes where we've done some horrific things as well as some good. But to think that we can one day eliminate all that kamma is just delusional. It's impossible. Just look at the math. It's impossible. What I didn't mention is there is in Jainism, and one time a Jain person said this, where, remember the regret, apologizing, and ascetic practices which address the, the loose, tight, tighter, and tightest types of bonds of kamma that a jiva will have attached to it, which they're trying to release themselves from. What they have is basically, these can be performed by oneself. They can be asked by someone else, I mean, asked from someone else to do it for us, or paid. Somebody else could get paid to carry that burden. So they can actually speed up the process of a karma to take shape, to come to fruition sooner than at a later time. And Jain, Jain uh, individuals are known in India to be one of the wealthiest classes in, in, in Indian culture. Everyone knows that. Uh, even though non-possession, aparigraha, is one of their uh, highest um, principles uh, at the bottom of, uh, well, it starts with ahinsa. Ahinsa is the non-violence, which is another thing that they equate with metta. That in Dhamma we have, metta. It's not the same. Totally different. To avoid walking over grass simply because I might kill animals is harmlessness, yes. It can be considered as ahinsa, fine. Nonviolence, maybe, that's how it's translated. However, when you really dig deep enough to look at it as to the reasons, remember Chetana, which is number one in the Dhamma, intention, that needs to be looked at very carefully. Why am I doing this? When you look deep enough, you will find there is a desire for something to be gained by me, the person, not doing this. So on the outside, it might look like harmlessness for all intents and purposes. But when you look at the intentionality behind it, it's completely different than, for example, metta. Metta is one of the four Brahma Viharas. It teaches you selflessness. There isn't a business mentality behind it. Remember, in the Jain tradition, it is what that the person is after. It is cutting out, cleaning out the Kamma. Because the objective in Jainism is, one, to eliminate the uh, present Kamma that you are carrying on your Jiva, and second, uh, not to uh, accumulate new ones. So the disturbing part that I found out about, in, uh, which takes place, unfortunately, in places like in India, is they hire individuals who are very, very poor. And 
this I heard from a Jain person, a very well-known teacher who happened to be Jain. Um, he's passed on now. But he says what they do is, and they don't talk about this openly, but they get uh, mattresses that are old, full of bed bugs, insects, blood-sucking insects. And then they hire individuals to come and lay on them, to sleep on them. And they look, these individuals who are paying them, they look through the window. And they see these individuals in pain, screaming. But the longer they sit there, they lie on the bed, the more money they're going to make. Remember that part about paying someone else to bear the burden of one's own kamma? That's what we're talking about. So their system, their philosophy allows this. How can that even possibly remotely be similar to the Dhamma, to what we understand of kamma? Lord Buddha never promised us that you're going to eliminate all your kamma. It's impossible. And remember, Lord Buddha was a realist. He was a realist. He was a humanist, but he was a, a realist as well. He didn't lie. Now what an arahant does, in contrast to a person who has a liberated jiva, as in Jainism, is they no longer have pono bhavika. They don't have any craving for the next birth, for the next thing. There's no tanha. But they still have to carry the burden of, as long as they have panchupadana kanda, the five aggregates. Pancha, upadana, kanda. The grabbing aggregates, the five. Nama, rupa, vedana, sanya, sankara, vinyana. Those are the things that make us beings. As long as the person is alive, they still have to deal with the Kamma Vipakas from their past. Even Lord Buddha had to deal with his back pain. So he was not ignoring these facts. But because the Arahant no longer has any desire, any Pono Bhavika for the next life, for something other than this, they close their eyes, they close their eyes for good. There's no Jina, there's no Tirtankara, there's no heaven like they have for Nigantanataputta, because they believe that there are 24 Tirtankaras, uh, their leaders or Tathagatas that they've had, they live in a formless upper realm somewhere. They're perfected. Yes, for them, apparently. So, uh, there's more to be said, but if you'd like to know more about the differences and similarities, I'm sure the, uh, the internet is full of them. But they won't necessarily talk about the suttas. That's why I wanted to uh, mention the other things that we do not uh, know about. And because we live in a politically correct atmosphere in the world, people don't want to say things that might hurt the other person, even though it's factual. Unfortunately, you also had the Sangiti Sutta that was uh, uh, taught by Venable Sariputta. That was taught right after Nigantanata Putta died, because they saw how it was their tradition was breaking apart. They no longer were a cohesive body of followers. So Venerable Sariputta saw that and he said, we, shouldn't, we should be careful so that this doesn't happen to us when Lord Buddha dies. Unfortunately, like I was saying the other day with the Tipitaka, you know, with the first council already things were happening, but especially the second council with the Vajis and all that, we had so many schools of Buddhism. It's just human nature to this day. So everybody's going to have a different interpretation. That's why I always say, leave the commentaries, go back to the suttas. 
the Pali Suttas, you have to go there. Leave Visuddhimagga, leave all these other stuff. They came later. They were not Lord Buddha's teachings. But it's not a popular position. It's not. Venerable Bhante Nyanananda, Katukurunde Nyanananda was, was not respected. Because he actually said what I was saying the other day. And he, I consider him one of my teachers. Beautiful, knowledgeable, bhikkhu. But he wasn't respected. Because he was presenting uh, a way to, for us to go back to Lord Buddha's teachings. Leaving the commentaries outside. Ehi pasiko. What is ehi pasiko? Come and see. Test it yourself. It's called sandittiko. Why? Directly visible. By whom? By the person. Pachattam vedita bovinyuhi. To be realized by the person for themselves. We forget that. We take someone else's word. When I say I don't believe in this or that, that's a very Buddhist statement. <laughs> and some people are sh shocked when I say I don't even believe in Lord Buddha. <gasps> How could you say that? Well, because I believe in the experience of what Lord Buddha taught as true for myself. I have seen it. One time a Brahmin came and he wanted to test. Lord Buddha was here and then Venerable Sariputta was next to him. And he saw how respectful Venerable Sariputta was to Lord Buddha. And he says to Lord Buddha, your student must have strong belief in you. Mustn't he? And Lord Buddha turns to Sariputta and says, Sariputta, do you believe in me? And he says, Oh no, Bhante. He says, what? The man is surprised. I don't believe in you, Bhante, he says. I know the Dhamma for myself. Now, how many people can do that today? We all like to join a camp. We just want to be followers. Lord Buddha never wanted us to be just blind followers. This is not a path for blind following. You have to have courage. That is some vega. Urgency. How long of a life do you have? Do I have? We don't know. So every moment must count. We live as if we have, you know, indefinite <laughs> lifespan or something. Devas don't even have that. So to appreciate the life, the, the air we have in our lungs, to make the most of our life and to make our understanding of the Dhamma to be as pertinent, as real, and as effective to, to change our, the quality of our lives. So I will uh, stop here and uh, ask if there are questions that I could try to address. Don't be shy. <laughs> yes. Ah, I've never come across uh, an instant uh, where, where that uh, might have taken place. Um, in those days, even in our lifetime, I've come across um, religious leaders, especially in India, who, uh, you know, one person might express the desire to meet the other, and the other would say, uh, well, if he wants to see me, let him come to me, type of a thing. And that person would say the same thing. So that tells you something about the level of maturity. Uh, so that is something that I've come across in my lifetime that has happened in the 90s. So, and given what we know through the suttas uh, about the relationship the dynamic relationship. I've never seen any derogatory term, however, uh, where Lord Buddha had given or any permission or injunction or a push or giving them a loaded question or as they say, two-horned questions to any of his students to go and trap 
uh, Mahavira. But we see this again and again on part of the Mahavira or his people. And the, the crown of that, I think, was the Upali Sutta, which um, I've given a commentary on the Upali Sutta in the past, a few months ago, last year, actually. Um, it's a wonderful sutta. I highly recommend you, you read it. It's from the Majjhima Nikaya. Beautiful sutta. Beautiful. It, it's important for us to be exposed to the suttas. There's so much. Because sometimes we lose our track, you know, just, just be lost in interpretation of what Lord Buddha said or meant by this or that teacher. No. We have to first know the suttas. At least read them once. That's why I've been dedicating the last five years of my life to convert the suttas into recordings. So you don't have to do the work. I've done it for you. You just have to hit play and you listen on YouTube. So, um, so I hope that answers your question. I don't know if it does answer your question. <laughs> Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Yes? Seems to, I'm sorry. Contradicting each other. Contradicting each other. Uh, in the sense that, say, the concept of personality arises because of five aggregates. Five aggregates. Five aggregates, yes. The five aggregates causes you to think that there's a cell. There's a cell, there's a personality. And yet, when uh, you mentioned a sutta on the. Uh, <coughs> Person that keeps on saying that there is a soul. Oh, um, uh, Sati, Sati, son of a fisherman. <laughs> so when a person dies, it's a soul that keeps on uh, 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 getting replaced by It's a Buddha series now. Yeah. So, but, so when one dies, when one dies, the consciousness is, is no more. So, how this rebirth? Ah, confusing to you, yes. I, that, that actually makes it more of a fairer type of a question, I would consider it. Um, to give a general, like an umbrella term that no, the teachings are complicated or, or confusing by themselves, that, I don't think that would be a fair statement. Um, there's many causes. Because of causes, there are consequences. There is an effect. Very, very bluntly put, cause and effect. Action, reaction. But that doesn't say much, especially when you're talking about a human being. You might have heard of miscarriages, for example. A woman who was pregnant, where the seed, the egg and the sperm met, so there was an embryo, it was attached to a uterine wall, okay and the mother knows three weeks have passed so she knows and she's she's excited suddenly until the baby comes out nine months later it's still a big question now long before that stage comes when the meeting of the egg and the sperm are about to take place you have some of the elements present. Some of the Panchakanda are still coming together. They're not all there because the Vijnana is not there yet. All these things have to meet. Just like you, you being present here, you have to fulfill certain requirements. You have to get into your car or the bus. You have to make sure you have the time to be here. You have to, you have to decide which is a priority for me to take place now. Should I go? It's a Sunday night at 8 p.m. That, compared to a human being formulating inside the womb, essentially follows the same mechanism of criteria being met first. Now, of course, when you look at a person, we say, oh, personality. 
personality. They, if you have the five aggregates, you're going to have a personality. What many people don't understand is Lord Buddha never said there's no self. He would say, he would point to himself and say the Tathagata, myself, he would use these terms. It is the attitude that the person has. So when we are personifying, personifying, when you look at yourself in the mirror and you're combing your hair and you see a few extra gray hairs, or you see a skin deformation or a wound or something, what happens to you? Does it make you feel pain, dissatisfaction, dukkha? Does it give you that? That is where the problem lies. That is turning the panchakanda into pancha upadana kanda. You are holding this as mine. Why did this happen to me? Why am I losing my memory? Alzheimer's. I'm not supposed to get that. Why are my knees hurting? It shouldn't happen to me. It should happen to someone else. That is the problem. That is what Lord Buddha is pointing at and saying, there's no essence there. There isn't me happening to me. It's just a process. If you have a body, there was a man who came once to Lord Buddha and he was crying. He says, why should people die? Why should there be Dukkha? And Lord Buddha said, Were you born? And he says, Bhante, of course I was born. I mean, talking to you, of course I was born. And he says, If you're born, you're going to die. But how do you live? There are people who are dying every day, even though they're living in healthy bodies. Why? Because they are stuck, they are captives, they are slaves of their thoughts. As a psychotherapist, I've worked with so many people, when you look at their lives, they have many things that you and many people would envy. They have a healthy body, good genes, money, this, that. No obvious reason for them to be feeling pain. But they do. And that is where we have to go back to the craving. Because the person is experiencing what? The first noble truth. What? Dukkha. We complicate things. It shouldn't be complicated. Remember, many of the people who became Sotapanna, Sakadagamis, Anagamis, many of them were lay people who just were not even able to read and write. They weren't going to sit down and, and, and you know, break down the Paticca Samuppada. They didn't know. So that's why Lord Buddha gave him a very simple tool. He said, do you experience Dukkha? Arya Satcha number one. This person is experiencing Dukkha. We never ask why though. Because we get stuck on, this is my pain. Why should this be happening to me? Why does this always happen to me? What is that? That means I'm holding on and making this my pain. That is atta. That is what Lord Buddha is saying. No, 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 no. There's no atta. That's why he said anatta. But he never said there's no self. He would use it conventionally, those terms. But sometimes, you know, with, because of the philosophers and commentators, they come and mess up everything. Because commentators love their own ideas. They don't care for the Dhamma, ultimately. They just care about their egos. Because Lord Buddha taught a very simple formula, Dukkha. Show me one person who doesn't know Dukkha. But not all of us are actually aware of Dukkha mindful of it when it's happening. Because if I'm not mindful of Dukkha, I'm not experiencing Dukkha. I need to know, taste, understand that there's Dukkha. Second, I need to ask, where is this Dukkha coming from? My holding on to, this is my pain, I want to get rid of it. That 
is the source of the pain. The moment you let go, there isn't that weight. That's why the Dhamma is immediately effective. Sandittiko. But we like to be lost in concepts and we make the Dhamma more complicated than it's supposed to be. Why? Because the moment you let go, it's Niroda. Don't stick your hand in the oven if you're saying your hand is burning. The moment you pull your hand out, at least it's no longer burning. And how do you do it? Practice the Magga. Atangika Magga, the Eightfold Path. Samadhiti. If you already are seeing Dukkha, already you're on the right path of Samadhiti. Right view. In Jainism, for example, there's no Samadhiti. There's Michaditi, unfortunately. But they're not just in Jainism. You have a lot of uh, Michaditi in Buddhism. So it's, it's our understanding. So please don't look at the Dhamma as a complicated uh, mechanism or system. It's not. Use your life as the laboratory. Don't believe anything that I'm saying. First, look, is there suffering? You're suffering because of something. What is the cause of it? Well, I want something to happen that is not happening. Or I want something that is happening to stop happening. The question then is, how badly do I want? Underline, underscore, the wanting part. That's the problem. That is what Lord Buddha called craving. The arising of it. Samudaya. Now, the moment you let go, it's like this. You're holding, and this might be one ton. You're saying, it's heavy. It's heavy. It's heavy. Uh, Buddha is saying, okay. But that takes courage for you to do. Otherwise, you're going to keep holding this until you die and say, well, this system doesn't work. The Dhamma doesn't work. Buddhism doesn't work. Lord Buddha's teaching doesn't work. It's too complicated. That's always your right. But is there samaditi there? And you will know if there is samaditi or not. If there is less of the pain, that means thanks to you, you have seen something. You have seen your contribution to the pain. And the moment you let go of it, you also see, ah, there is Niroda. That's good. Oof. You know what Niroda is. That moment, you don't have to become a bhikkhu. You don't have to spend the rest of your life meditating or doing this and that to taste Niroda. Niroda could be tasted any moment you let go of your attachment to something. And so long as you have an attachment to something, there will be pain. How complicated is this? A good question though. Very good question. Any other thoughts? I know the Bhantes have to go. <laughs> but thank you for being here. Yes, yes. Any other thoughts? Okay, let's uh, share some merits. Akasatha Jagumata Deva Nagama Hiddika Punyantanganamo Ditwa Chiran Rakhan Tuloka Sasanan Akasatha Jagumata Deva Nagama Hiddika Punyantanganamo Ditwa Chiran Rakhan Tudesanan Akasatha Jagumata Deva Nagama Hiddika Punyan dangan moditva chirang rakhantu mamparanti sa